Great to see everyone here, and it's great to see some emotion behind some talks. So, all right, my talk is on <clears throat> dual mobility. These are my disclosures. So I, uh, I like the foundation and its uh, role in what we're trying to do with regards to hip surgery in general. And the dual mobility bearing is not a new concept. It's been around for many decades, and it's had a uh, recent resurgence, and it's uh, really kind of dwindled along in some areas, but has had a big resurgence in the last 10 years. So why are we discussing DM constructs as an option for total hip arthroplasty? Looking at larger reviews of database uh, <clears throat> outcomes, it's actually done quite well. So systematic review of primary and revision total hip arthroplasty, dislocation is significantly diminished with dual mobility constructs as compared to <clears throat> uh, traditional constructs. Dislocation and revision is even probably more of an issue, and we've seen uh, reduction in this with the use of dual mobility articulations. So I think the studies support the midterm survivorship, or the efficacy of this construct and the midterm survivorship looks pretty good. So I think it's worth a look. So dual mobility total hip, from my standpoint, I have been uh, given the task of talking about design. Is there a difference between designs? Are there winners and losers in the dual mobility world? So monoblock versus modular dual mobility is probably the most common or the biggest debate that goes on. So we'll talk a little bit about that. So important concepts in dual mobility articulations jump distance, Charlie Boer, range of motion before prosthetic impingement and fixation options. These are really my top four when I think about dual mobility. Important concepts, the jump distance, which is nothing new to us. It really talks about head diameter versus, um, importantly, trunnion diameter. Uh, and that is something that we'll talk about with regards to resurfacing as well. The Charlie Boer is a cylindrical elevation of the liner above the hemisphere of the head. Not all constructs uh, share this design feature. And then range of motion before prosthetic impingement also favors dual mobility articulations over large femoral heads. And so this can enable a uh, soft tissue deficient hip to sometimes remain stable as opposed to uh, having recurrent instability episodes. And then monoblock versus modular dual mobility, the outer diameter poly heads for monoblocks are typically four to seven millimeters larger for a given OD outer diameter shell size. So the increased jump distance, thicker poly insert, more likely to reach a 28 millimeter inner diameter head for these uh, monoblock designs versus the modular design. So this contributes to greater stability given uh, for any given shell size. We talked about the uh, Charnley bore and some monoblocks and very few modular dual mobilities have the uh, extended cylindrical uh, anatomy of the uh, Charlie Bohr. Sorry, what did I just do there? So monoblock versus dual mobility. For most systems, the smallest shell OD available favors the monoblock design. So 40 for me, it's helpful in the dysplastic or really complex primary. 46 is usually where the modular dual mobilities kick in. So fixation and compromised bone really becomes the question. So I ask people, why do they use modular dual mobilities? And they say it's so I can put my screws in my cup. So for revisions or poor bone quality, obviously this favors a modular dual mobility. Monoblocks available with some adaptation for uh, extra hemispherical fixation, but certainly not superior dome screws as many people have, or many surgeons are accustomed to. So what do we know about wear and dual mobilities? There's been some concerns recently voiced with uh, looking at five-year data on dual mobility constructs, this one coming out of uh, Indianapolis. And then migration wear of dual mobility acetabular constructs at three years, looking at RSA data. It actually shows an initial bedding in period in the first year. This is thought to be due, due to the second articulation. But after that, year two and three shows a very acceptable linear and annual wear rate of 0.02 millimeters per year. This is another uh, study looking at five-year polyethylene cup migration. So 44 hips, again, this is the, uh, not a modular dual mobility, but this is a monoblock construct. Polyethylene wear rate at years two to five is 0.07 millimeters per year, very acceptable. So what do we know about metal ions and dual mobility? This is one of the things that brings up concern and we look at patients, this is one study that came out in 2020, modular dual mobility components and cobalt chromium uh, intermetal heads are associated with an increased risk of higher metal ions. So this is a modular dual mobility design, two to 10 years post total hip, 
30% of patients had elevated metal ion levels, and this was associated with higher activity index scores. Serum metal ions in dual mobility articulations, this is a review of 248 modular dual mobility showing 5% of patients have elevated cobalt levels and 1.6 elevated chromium. However, no hips revised for metal ion issues at this time frame. And then the incidence of liner mouse seeding, which seems to be linked to the issue with ion production. This is out of the uh, Hip Society 2019. So basically at 5.6% of liners were mouse seeded. There were no mouse seeded liners in one design, the, the Zimmer Biomet group. And there were 32 mouse seeded liners at 6.1% in the Stryker uh, <clears throat> design, utilizing different shells whether it be the PSL or the Trident. So my current indications for dual mobility, a complex primary with an acetabulum less than 46 millimeters, which usually would put me at a 20, 28 millimeter inner di uh, or articulation if I was not using dual mobility, a complete uh, abductor deficient hip, perhaps after a uh, takedown of an arthrodesis. The stiff spine that was discussed earlier, which I think has gotten a lot of play and in the DA world, probably uh, less than it deserves. But lumbar sacral fusion with head size less than 36 will take me over to a dual mobility. And then revision total hip, recurrent instability with well-aligned components, conversion of large diameter metal on metal, monoblocks that have failed for metallosis issues. We published on this a few years back, looking at conversion off-label to dual mobility and has done well in failed constrained liners. So my bias is the monoblock. It avail it's available in the sizes I need, which is usually 40 to 46. Optimized head to shell, superior range of motion to the modular dual mobility, and it removes modularity from my equation. So we've, we've been down this road before. I think the superior rec track record of the monoblock is why I like it. So my summary for the dual mobility, dislocation is still a clinical challenge for some surgeons and also depending on the approach. DM can offer an advantage not all DM designs are the same, and you need to know what the design differences are. Monoblock allows optimized geometry and avoids metal ion release. MDM allows better fixation, but introduces another metal articulation. So polyethylene wear data shows some early ele elevation with bedding in, but actually looks quite good at the five-year mark, so I think that's reassuring for the dual mobility users. And I think we should proceed with this awareness and track our results. We've been burned before. Thank you.